Right, okay, let's start. Uh, welcome everybody uh, to our inaugural Hemochromatosis UK Ask the Doctor session. Uh, obviously, we're living in very interesting times at the moment, and we are delighted to be joined today by Dr. Susan Hancock. Uh, Susan is one of the charity's uh, clinical advisors and is also a fellow of the Royal College of GPs. And uh, Susan's going to help us with a few of the questions which we've had to come in um, from members over the last uh, 24 hours. So welcome to Susan. Thank you very much. Susan, do you want to tell everyone a little bit about your background? Because you're, you're, you're not simply a GP, are you? You do quite a few things. Yes, I'm, I'm actually uh, retired from general practice clinically. Um, but um, I, not recently, I must say, but I actually help um, uh, with medical students. I teach medical students at the University of Central Lancashire two days a week, and I'm also a GP appraiser. So I do do a little bit of work um, in a sort of semi-retirement situation. I have, however, been asked to rejoin the NHS, which is an interesting thing after a period of time. Uh, by the GMC, and I'm waiting to see what's uh, going to happen about that in this crisis. Great. So I hope, I hope to be able to answer your questions. Um, okay, well, we've, got, we've got loads of questions. We, we put a call out to our members, uh, and we said, please, can you send us your questions within 24 hours? And in fact, we've had over 100 questions. Wow. Um, but what we've tried to do is to sort of select some that are kind of representative of the sorts of things that people are asking. Um, so apologies if one of, if you're a member and your question has not um, been asked on the uh, the webinar, but we have tried to include as many as we can. So without further ado, let's let's turn to our first um, let's turn to our first uh, question, which came from Rosanna in London. Um, does having genetic hemochromatosis increase our risks from COVID nineteen? Oh, hi, Rosanna. That's a very good question. And I'm sure a lot of people are asking the same thing. If you have no organ damage, either your heart, your liver, your kidneys or diabetes or any of the things that put you in an at risk category, um, then the answer is simply no, you are the same as everybody else uh, in terms of your risk from COVID-19. Fantastic. So hopefully that's a bit reassuring for quite a few people. So, so really the key message there is genetic hemochromatosis in and of itself doesn't put you at increased risk, but obviously we all need to be taking care, staying at home, staying safe, um, following the government advice. Absolutely. I mean, because you're as the same as everybody else does not mean that you shouldn't be taking the advice that we've all been given about dis social distancing and washing our hands frequently. Um, that's for everybody. Great. Okay. Well, that was um, that was off to a good start. Let's see our next question. So this one's come from Jerry and Woking. Uh, what effect, if any, will coronavirus have on people such as myself with hemochromatosis? Well, this nicely follows on from the previous question uh, and does depend on whether or not you have um, any uh, any damage to your vital organs in your body, or if you're over seventy, i.e., you're in the at-risk group. Um, if you are in the at-risk group, I'm afraid there's a slightly increased chance that the, um, the virus will uh, affect you more severely. Um, I'm sorry to say that, but if you're not and, and everything is good and you're well in control with your hemochromatosis, then it's, it's exactly the same as everybody else. And the effect, if you do get it, and let's hope you don't, um, can actually go from really hardly knowing you've got it uh, many people are walking around uh, who actually are carrying this virus and no, have no symptoms um, to possibly getting some uh, sort of fairly severe respiratory symptoms where you have difficulty breathing. And that's including uh, a high temperature, uh, muscle pain, headache, uh, and as I said before, difficulty breathing with usually a dry cough. Occasionally, some people do produce some mucus, that, but that's normally if they have underlying chest condition. I hope that's of help, Jerry. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. And, and actually, I don't know if this is going to be of any help to people, but I've been self-isolating for a week because I've had the symptoms and uh, I'm, I'm in my late 40s. I've got hemochromatosis and it's been very much like, um, like the flu, but with an extra sore throat. 
Um, so I haven't been tested. We don't know for sure if it is actually COVID-19, but I've had many of the symptoms which people have been talking about. And so I am sequestered here in my uh, home away from everybody else just to be on the safe side so I don't spread it around if I do have it. But uh, for many people, as you say, Susan, the, uh, the symptoms and the impact is actually quite mild, even for people with hemochromatosis. Okay, let's move on. Um, so this is someone um, in Bristol. This is Jeremy. Uh, I have liver fibrosis as a result of genetic hemochromatosis. Would I be considered as a high risk if I contracted COVID-19? Um, it's a good question, Jeremy, and thank you for bringing up. I'm sorry to hear that you have uh, some damage to your liver, which is what fibrosis means. Um, and that is a consequence of, uh, of the hemochromatosis. I'm afraid that does put you in, a, in an at-risk group. Um, you should be getting a message on Sunday from NHS via text, um, the 29th, basically putting you in a, that high-risk category. Um, I hope that's going to happen. If not, I would consider e emailing your practice and reminding them that you have this problem. Um, so that you can be categorized uh, as being in the high risk category. Um, just keep safe, um, be extra vigilant about your distancing. In fact, I'd suggest you don't really go out uh, unless absolutely necessary. If you can get people to do all your, all your chores, uh, be lazy and do that. Okay, and, and for anybody who's watching this, if you are concerned about um, getting help with getting your groceries in and things like that. If you go to our coronavirus updates page on the Hemochromatosis Org UK website, we have actually got a link in there to the UK government service where they're actually asking people if they feel that they might need some extra help with things like groceries to actually put their names down. And they will then be contacted directly by the new volunteer help force, which was set up earlier this week by the UK government. So if you do um, live on your own or it's just not going to be practical for people to get out and uh, to get groceries, particularly in these sorts of circumstances, do go to our website, find the link, sign up, and the government will give you some extra assistance. Yeah. Okay, moving on. So um, Andy's in Pat with Everard, which um, I think is in Cambridgeshire, uh, not a million miles away from our uh, offices. Uh, he says, I'm 57 and have hemochromatosis and also have a fatty liver. Is there any evidence to suggest that I would have any increased risk of complications if I was to contract COVID-19? This is a difficult question uh, for me to answer um, completely, Andy. So do forgive me if, if there's a little bit of this and that. Um, first of all, you're not in the age group uh, to be worried about. Um, the hemochromatosis by itself, if it's under control, is fine, but the fatty liver has a question mark over it. Now, if there is no other damage to, uh, to any other organs in your body um, and you don't have diabetes or any breathing problems and the diagnosis of fatty liver is absolutely definite, then you should be okay. However, there's a lot of ifs and buts there and I'm aware of that. And I would suggest that you probably try and contact your general practitioner who will have all your records to ask this question. I would do this by email, don't try ringing the surgery. Most of the GPs are working remotely um, and are quite happy to answer emails. And I think the, the GP, uh, your GP will have all the details and will be in a much better position to answer that question. Um, regardless of that, Andy, all the other things um, that we have been talking about, social distancing, hand washing, not going out unless you absolutely have to still apply. Fantastic, so Andy, hopefully that will give you some, some pointers. Get in touch with your uh, GP via email in the first instance. Great, yeah. okay, let's move on. Okay, so Claire in Chesterfield, um, am I classed as vulnerable as I'm a carrier? Claire, this, Claire this, is an, yeah, this is an easy one. And the answer is no, unless you have some other problem that puts you in the vulnerable group. Just being a carrier would not do that. There we are. That was a nice, quick and easy one. So carriers, 
uh, are not in the vulnerable group. So um, be reassured about that. Fantastic. Okay, let's move on. Um, Dean in London, and actually we've had a lot of queries about this actually. Uh, should I keep attending my vinisection appointments? Asks Dean. Hello, Dean. And I'm quite surprised that you are being asked to come because uh, over most of the country, venisection has been sort of terminated for a period of at least four months until July. Um, I, again, this is a, is a sort of other situation. If they are calling you to come up, I'm suggesting that they've done a risk assessment on, on you attending, how much you need your venisection and thought about it. Um, however, you need to think about how you're going to get to your appointment. Um, can you get there safely? Um, do you, you know, I wouldn't suggest that you start jumping on tubes that are full of people going to other work situations. So you need to seriously think about, can I get to my venisection appointment safely with distancing? And if you can, and they're calling you, then I would seriously consider going. Fantastic. Okay, great. Thanks for that, Susan. Dean, hopefully that gives you some more pointers there. Um, I think we have another one, which is maybe similar. Yeah. Um, so this is Jill in London. If I miss venisections, which she normally attends every eight weeks, what is a safe maintenance level to let her ferritin rise to? Normally, she's aiming for around 50. Um, so, Susan, what, what advice do we have for Jill? Yeah, I had to think about this quite a lot, Jill. Um, and I do understand your predicament. There'll be quite a lot of people in this situation. Um, you, your normal ferritin for a woman is below 160. So if you're normally kept around 50, you've quite a way to go before you hit 160. I do appreciate that it, the control is 50, but exceptional circumstances. Now, damage to organs, at the moment, the evidence would suggest that if you can keep your ferritin below 1,000, that there will be minimal damage. So we're way, way, way off that. So I think that for the sake of four months keeping safe, um, you are going to be fine. Um, if, however, you are concerned and you want to have a ferritin check a bit later on, maybe if you contacted your general practitioner um, by email again and requested it just to make sure it's, it's not going crazy. But I think it's very unlikely, Jill, so relax, sit back, don't worry too much about it. There we go. Excellent advice. Very reassuring. Thank you, Susan. Okay, let's move on. So this is from Joanne. Um, my venous section has been postponed for six months. I've been going twice weekly for 16 weeks and my levels have dropped from over 4,000 to just below 800. How much of a backward step will could this be if she doesn't get venous section for six months? Joanne, a very good question and well done for getting your, um, your ferritin down from 4,000 to 800. That's quite an effort. Uh, remember that it has taken years and years and years to get up to 4,000. It's not something that happens overnight. Um, and I, I appreciate that you haven't hit your target at 800, but during the period of time that we have been asked to keep away, it will increase, I can't say that it won't, but it shouldn't uh, send you anywhere near the levels that you started at. They'll just have to restart the uh, twice weekly venisections when the hospital are open. So there will be a backward step. I can't say there won't, but it shouldn't be massive. And I'm quite sure things will be able to get back in control in the summer when we're through the other end of this virus. So please try not to worry too much, Joanne. And Susan, uh, we, we get asked a lot by members what things they might be able to do in terms of diet. Are there any kind of key things? I mean, we have a, a healthy eating yes. and living well guide published on the website. So if people haven't already downloaded that and read it, it it's certainly worth a look. But are, are there one or two things that people might usefully do themselves in terms of diet or, or is diet really not going to make a lot of difference at this stage? I think you have to be very careful with the diet because if you start cutting out, you know, vitamin C 
uh, things like vitamin C, high iron stuff as all increases iron absorption, then you can reduce your immunity a little bit. I would suggest, however, that maybe if you avoid red meat, um, it's probably not a bad idea, and have a little look at the hemochromatosis um, uh, advice about which foods are very high in, in iron, and maybe just try to keep them to a minimal, but don't cut anything right out because you're in danger of, of making yourself deficient of something along the way. Uh, but yes, you can, you can to a certain extent, um, reduce the rise uh, of the iron in your body if you're a little bit careful. But take some advice from the website, from the dietary advice on the website. Okay, great. Okay, let's move on. And this is from Angela in Northern Ireland. And actually, this is a very common um, question which we're being asked on our helplines at the moment. Um, and if people do feel the need to talk to someone about uh, genetic hemochromatosis or COVID-19, um, do go to our website, have a look at the helplines link. Um, we're open weekdays, 12 till 3. And we also provide an email helpline service, which is getting pretty close to 24 by 7. <laughs> uh, we have an, a, a small army of very dedicated volunteers, most of whom have genetic hemochromatosis, who have received specialist training. And some of the advice which they're able to provide over email is particularly useful at the moment if you're not able to get through on the phone. But anyway, so Angela Northern Ireland asked, I was due to have a vincection two weeks ago, but the hospital canceled due to coronavirus. When or how will I get this done now? Okay, um, you don't say whether you are in a treatment or maintenance phase, um, Angela. Nice to hear from you. But I'm assuming from the tone of the question that you are actually in maintenance phase. Um, I'm going to suggest that uh, there is a possibility that you could have your venous section done uh, through the blood and, and, and transplant organization, um, but you will need to have a referral made from uh, your consultant. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. That's my husband. <laughs> Guys, I'm sorry, he is actually a doctor as well, so apologies for that. Um, well, we, we might grab him later, actually, if he's, <laughs> he's got a, any he's wisdom. A retired obstetrician, so if any of you are pregnant, okay. that would be quite useful. Okay, okay. Um, well, we'll, so we'll get on to that. <laughs> I, I would suggest if you can get hold of your hospital consultant and he could maybe send a letter over to um, the uh, blood and transplant organisation, this could be expedited. It, it is a good way because your blood would be useful then. And just on that note, actually, um, if I hold this up, you may be able to see that, but the Northern Ireland um, Blood uh, Transfusion Service actually have information leaflets for donors in Northern Ireland who have hemochromatosis. Um, this is something we've been working on for um, the last year or so, and these are available. Um, so do give the uh, Blood Transfusion Service a ring. Uh, for anyone in Northern Ireland, if, you, if you're not aware what the telephone number is, it's 29 nine zero three two one four one four so i'll just give that to you again if you're in northern ireland please if you're not in northern ireland don't ring this number because they won't be able to help help you but if you live in northern ireland and you're concerned you want to get registered as a donor give these guys a ring it's zero two nine nine zero three two one four one four and that information is also available on our website so if you have a look at the can i donate page uh, we have all the information for northern ireland for Scotland, for Wales, and for England. So please do take advantage of that. We put a lot of work into trying to get ourselves recognized by the yeah. donation services. Uh, do give them a ring if you're concerned and you want to see if you can help. Yeah, and that occurs, uh, that's the same for anybody who is, um, has no reason why they can't donate the blood to the um, NHS for use. Um, this is a good time to push for that really. Yeah, well, let's let's see. I think our next question may be in a similar vein. So yeah. this is Joe in Blackheath. So we're a little bit further out from London now, not not that far. But all venous sections have been cancelled at my local hospital. Would it be possible to get them done by blood donation unit? Great question, Joe. Yeah, very good question, Joe. And and right up to the to the mark. Um, yes, it, it it's not impossible. Um, however, you will need a referral letter. 
um, and hopefully um, your consultant will have a sort of standard letter that he can send for you to the blood transfusion service and it can be organized. Um, I really don't see why not. Uh, and your blood is useful. They're desperate at the moment for blood. So this would be a good thing, Joe. So again, um, this leaflet, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm well organized here with my leaflets. I'm just sitting here with our membership pack. I'm just going to pull some of these things out. But actually, we have been working again very closely with NHS Blood and Transplants in England and Wales. And this leaflet explains the process for becoming a donor if you have genetic hemochromatosis. It is available for download off our website. So if you go to the Can I Donate page, which hopefully you can find if you just search for donate uh, using the search bar, you'll find this it actually sets out the process and actually it's relatively straightforward now. It used to be up until about a year ago, there was a lot of faffing about, a lot of paperwork, a lot of nonsense involved. It's now been streamlined and we as a charity have been working very closely with NHS Blood and Transplant to try and make this as easy a process as possible because as Susan says, they are keen to receive the blood, particularly at the moment. So get onto the website, have a look for this leaflet, this particular leaflet is specific to England and Wales, but as I said earlier, we do have telephone numbers, contact details for the other uh, nations and regions uh, services. So do give them a ring or ping them an email if you're interested in donating. Okay, um, now I think we've got another blood donation question. So this is, um, uh, this is Roland in Camberley. I normally donate blood to NHS Blood and Transplant for my venous section. So here is someone who, is yeah. already well uh, versed in this process of going to the blood donor center. Will they still want my blood? I'm currently fit and well. Roland, this is an easy answer. Yes, 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 is the <laughs> three stage answer. Yes, of course, they will want your blood. They are, I, w I went on the website to check out and they're taking all precaution um, at their end to avoid um, admitting a uh, coronavirus into the into the clinical atmosphere of the donation you just have to get there safe that's the only thing i would say make sure that you can actually get to the unit safely uh, you don't have to get on a, a crowded bus or a, a tube or a train you can drive there and you can walk in they have distancing there and obviously they have uh, hand washing and personal hygiene and cleanliness that's all part of it so yes please go Excellent. Okay, well, that's very encouraging. Um, I think we have one more question about uh, donations. This is from Uta in Livingston in Scotland. My venous sections have been cancelled for six months and I'm not in maintenance yet. Why can't the blood donor service accept blood in the higher normal ranges? Now, uh, we might actually have a little update on this um, oh, early next week, but let me, let me just, let me give you the charity view on this. So, for anyone who's watching this on catch up, it's actually Thursday the 26th of March, okay? And I'm saying that because actually the situation is changing so rapidly that actually by next week it may be totally different. Um, but as of Thursday the 26th of March, we are working very closely with NHS Blood and Transplant at a senior level to discuss them relaxing the criteria for donors. And, and really what's driving that is some of these points which are coming from our members. So we feel very frustrated as a community that we um, receive therapeutic benefit from donating or giving our blood, um, mm. but, but none of us want to see it going into a hospital incinerator or being poured down the drain. Yeah. Um, so the conversations which are going on literally later on today are with senior people at NHSBT to see whether it is practical for them to flex and relax the criteria. So if you are in maintenance at the moment in England and Wales, you can definitely go and donate, as we've been saying. Go to our website, go and find the leaflet. Um, that's England and Wales, that's Northern Ireland. Um, but for people who are just outside the normal range, it is extremely frustrating. And mm. the discussion that we're having with NHSBT at the moment is really around are we able to help them or would it actually cause them more difficulties and more pressure at this very, very difficult time? So we don't have a final decision on that at the moment and we may not do for maybe a week mm -hmm. or two. But what we would say to people is if you are in maintenance and you can safely travel to a donor centre, then please consider registering as a donor. And if you're outside of maintenance and you're very, very close and you'd like to think about being a donor, Keep an eye on our website. 
keep an eye on our email newsletters. We will be reaching out to people if the advice and the guidance from NHSBT changes, we will let you know immediately because there is a national crisis on. We think as a community, you can do something to help. So uh, at the moment, I think Uta, you're in that situation where you're very, very close to being in maintenance, mm, yeah. but not quite close enough. So anyway, let me hand it over to Susan because I'm not a doctor, okay? I just, <laughs> you know, I've, I've just run this charity. So Susan, what are your thoughts? There's not much more I can add. Thank you, Neil. Um, uh, Uta, it's a very good question and absolutely no real clinical reason uh, because your blood is good and it's good for somebody else. Uh, if it has a little bit extra iron in it, that's not in any way detrimental. The problem is more of an administrative one, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, the problem is arranging maintenance, uh, checking bloods, who's going to okay, uh, and the blood donor service do not have a doctor in the room when you go uh, they have a nurse and the rest of the people there are health uh, health care assistants um, so they don't have the facility to monitor you uh, it has so a lot of coordination will need to be done and i think that's what neil is alluding to between um your results and and how it how you're controlled once you're in maintenance, everything is acceptable because you, you've gone through the main bit. And that's not a very good answer, but that's actually why it's not happening. Yeah, it's, it's not because you're not loved. It's just mm. the administrative side of it is just that bit more challenging at the moment when there's lots of other things going on. So thank you Uta, for your question. Let's, uh, let's move on. Um, we have Craig and Atherton. Um, my liver is in the NASH stage of disease. And for anyone watching who doesn't know what NASH is, it's, um, it's, a, it's a form of liver disease. Let me, let me just put it like that. <laughs> Maybe Susan can explain it a bit better than me. Um, but what Craig's asking is, if he has NASH, does this class him as a vulnerable person during the outbreak? Um, Craig, yes. Again, I had to think uh, quite clearly about this. Um, when you're in non-alcoholic related steatohepatitis, it means there is some inflammation to the basic liver cells. Um, so your liver is affected and this can result um, and often does in fibrosis, which we mentioned earlier on. Um, so as far as I am concerned, um, and I am willing to, for this to be discussed, I think this puts you in the vulnerable person range. Um, so you have to be extra vigilant um, because your liver is not working 100% normally. That means, Craig, that uh, you may get a telephone um, text message on Sunday. You may not. If not, I would check with your surgery because they may not be completely up to date with your records. Um, and double, double check with your GP, not by phone. Send them an email and, and check that this is the case um, and you'll have a little bit better idea because it is quite a big undertaking if you have to put yourself in the vulnerable person uh, category in terms of isolation. Uh, they are requesting quite a long period of time. Um, I'm sorry that, about that, Craig, but uh, I think it's better to be safe than sorry. Great, thanks, Susan. And just for anyone watching, if you're um, not sure about these different sorts of liver conditions, liver diseases, the British Liver Trust, which is uh, a charity based here in the UK has some fantastic resources on their website. Um, hopefully you can see at the bottom of the screen there, we've got a link through to this particular condition. Um, and they also run a helpline uh, on weekdays. And that helpline is staffed from about 10 o'clock in the morning through to about three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, go to the British Liver Trust website, um, find the details there, give them mm. a ring. They're super, super helpful. Uh, their helpline is staffed by qualified liver nurses. So if you have a known liver condition or liver disease, and you will know about this because you will have been told by your doctor, um, and you want to talk that through with somebody, uh, British Liver Trust actually have qualified liver nurses on their helpline who may be able to help you better uh, than perhaps we can. But um, good luck with that, uh, yeah. Craig. Okay, let's move on. Um, David in Willenhall, am I safe from coronavirus whilst undergoing <laughs> weekly vinisections? So David's managed to get to the hospital and they still <laughs> want to see him. 
Um, but is it safe for him to go? David, um, I think it's probably safe when you get into the room uh, for the Venice section and um, through the door. I would just reiterate what I said before. It's you've got to make sure that you get to the hospital safely. Um, uh, and that's an important bit and it needs a little bit of thinking about. We are again talking about not touching and, and distance, social distancing. Um, and maybe in your case, if it's difficult to get that and be reassured by that, maybe you ought to consider a face mask. I know it's not recommended for everybody, but in this situation where you have to get there, um, if it's still happening, I would consider that. Great, thanks, Susan. Um, our next question is actually a little bit, um, it's quite, quite a sad question, but let, let's just see what we can, we can do to help Paula in King Sutton. Um, so Paula's husband's seriously ill with COVID-19. Um, is there any additional aspect that she should pass on to his doctors? They know he has hemochromatosis. I'm really sorry, Paula, to hear that your husband is seriously ill. Um, I, I hope by the time we're talking that maybe he's not so seriously ill and is beginning to pull through. Um, no, I think as long as the doctors are aware of his hemochromatosis, um, and you probably need to keep repeating it um, on several occasions. Um, they should be accommodating um, around that. Um, obviously, if he has any organ damage from his hemochromatosis, um, they will have found that out by now. Um, but we wish you all the best. Um, obviously, if your husband is ill, you need to take uh, the necessary isolating precautions as well. And I, I understand that's very difficult because I suspect he's in hospital um, and you're going to have to isolate. So it's hard times and I wish you luck. Yeah, all our best wishes, uh, Paula, to you and your husband and the wider family. And uh, we hope that he's feeling better soon. <laughs> okay, so we have a we have a, a question from Irene, who's in the village somewhere. Um, <laughs> I, I, maybe this village, maybe she's, right, maybe she's around the corner from us. Um, but wherever you are, Irene, thank you very much for your question. It's lovely to hear from you. Um, Irene asks, she says, I have symptoms of coronavirus. What should I do? Okay, Irene, um, good morning. Um, there is a website, 111 uh, Coronavirus Service. I suggest that you go on there and there's a lot of detail you put your symptoms in and it, it is absolutely quite clear um, when you've entered your symptoms what you should do um, it may result in you calling for help or it may result in you just taking some simple procedures at home depending on your severity which obviously we can't tell from your question so that would be my advice get your computer fired up and go on your website uh, 111 coronavirus it is it's an nhs website um, and have a look about the advice. Fantastic. Okay, well, good luck with that, Irene. Um, and I think we now have our, our final question. So uh, thank you very much, Susan, for bearing with us. We've really rattled through these, which hopefully has been of some help to other people. But here is our final question for today from Rebecca in Curtin Lindsay. And actually, Curtin Lindsay, if you don't know, is actually very close to our office in Spalding. <laughs> um, so we're almost neighbours. Um, but anyway, Rebecca, thank you very much for your question. Um, Rebecca says, I've had COVID-19 symptoms and have been taking paracetamol. Could this have been contributing to my breathing difficulties? Um, good morning, Rebecca, um, and thank you for your question. Um, COVID-19 or coronavirus um, actually affects the lining of the lungs. Um, and so your breathing difficulties are very likely to be due to the virus itself affecting um, the way the oxygen gets into your body by inflaming the inside of your lungs. Paracetamol does not do this. So you are quite safe to take paracetamol for your symptoms. It will not make you short of breath. It's the actual virus that's doing that. Um, but probably if, you're, if you are breathless, you ought to be going again onto 111 Coronavirus uh, website, popping your details in and getting some advice online as to where you need to go with this. Um, you don't say how many days you're into it or anything else. So uh, I'm, that would be my best advice is pop in there and see what the suggestions are um, down the algorithm as to what you need to do. And good luck, Rebecca. 
That's great. Thanks, Susan. And earlier this week, there was a little bit of a, a controversy about ibuprofen versus paracetamol. Yes, versus... yes. Do, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, it's to do with the receptors on the, um, uh, on the surface of cells and how the coronavirus attaches. And it attaches through a thing called the ACE receptor. Um, and this is affected by ibuprofen um, in theory. Um, so I would suggest that probably you're safer to use paracetamol um, on the whole, although I did hear recently that um, ibuprofen has been cleared and you can use it. But my feeling is why use something that has a question mark over it if you can use something that doesn't? So I'd stick with paracetamol if you can. Drink plenty of fluids, keep out of the way of everybody else, obviously symptomatic, and, and just rest. If, you, if you're having difficulty breathing, don't move around too much. Just, just keep nice and still, and, and maybe even take to your bed for a couple of days. I don't know what you did, Neil, but uh, that would be my advice. But get, um, get some help. Use this website to, to, to plug in with your symptoms and see where you are and you'll have a little bit more information then. And uh, good luck with that, Rebecca. Fantastic. So um, that was our final question. Um, before we wrap up, I just wondered if it might be helpful to um, just highlight some of the resources that we have online. Um, now, hopefully, Susan, you can see our website. I can, yes. <laughs> Excellent, okay, the technology's <laughs> working, that's fantastic. Um, so we have uh, very recently actually upgraded our website, which is lucky because um, I think our old one would have run out of steam. It's, it's been under very, very intensive use by people, which is great. But as, as people will be able to see, we have our coronavirus update here uh, and we are trying to keep this up to date um, every day or two. We're not doing it necessarily right. every day because sometimes nothing much happens. Um, but what we are trying to do is to bring together some of the resources that we are um, finding which are reputable resources on the internet from the NHS and from other reputable sources of information. But we have quite a lot of material now building up here uh, with specific answers to specific questions which are related to genetic hemochromatosis. Um, so do, if you haven't already had a look at this, do have a look through. There's lots and lots of links in here. Um, and also what we're trying to do as well is wherever there is UK government advice, um, it's often not particularly well signposted online. Um, so we do try and actually give people a little bit of a heads up about where to be looking for certain things. So some of these um, links, which Susan's been referring to, are available on uh, this page. So do have a browse through of that. Um, if you feel that there's a question which um, we haven't managed to answer, um, do get in touch with us. You can do that very simply by coming to the contact us section of the website. And just to highlight a couple of other resources which may be useful at this um, slightly um, weird and also difficult time. Um, if you are interested in becoming a blood donor, um, here we are, can I donate blood? We've collated all the current advice uh, from NHSBT and the regional transfusion blood services here. Um, do have a read of this because if your vinisection has been cancelled for perhaps four or six months and you're concerned, you may be able to become a donor. Um, and we have all of the information about the criteria that you need to correspond with uh, there. The other thing which I just draw attention to is actually this whole thing about living well with genetic hemochromatosis and diet. So we have put all of our uh, leaflets and materials available online. You can download them. You don't need us to post them out. Just go to the website, download them, uh, and fill your boots with all of those sorts of things. Um, but please do take care, everybody. Um, it's a very challenging time for the NHS. It's very challenging for us as citizens, um, but together we will get through this and we will come out stronger, I'm sure. So do take care and stay safe. Um, and yes. Susan, um, I don't know, do you have any closing remarks? Um, it's obviously a very, very unusual time. Um, you qualified, I think, back in 1980, if I'm allowed yes. to say that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, this may be, I, I don't know, have you seen a global pandemic before? No, no. 
I haven't, no. This is the first um, time that it's been um, a global pandemic. I mean, I've seen pandemics because it's just above a certain level of infections, but not to this extent. It's unprecedented in my medical career. Um, I think when you understand a little bit about this virus and how it moves from A to B and how it infects, it does help. Um, and there's a lot of stuff online about that if you want to look it up. Um, but that's why the government brought out these rules and regulations because if we socially distance and we wash our hands, it can't actually spread in anything like the way that it has been doing. Um, it can't because it's not actually live outside anybody's body. It's just a little bit of RNA with a capsule around it, which is causing devastation. Yeah. Thank you. So, Thank good luck you, to everybody. Please, please, please um, be careful. Uh, don't worry too much. I say, I say to people, take it seriously, but don't panic. That's my message to you all. And be very careful about what you do. Thank you, Neil. Thank you very much, Susan. I think that's a really constructive point to, to end on. Um, thank you ever so much for taking the time today. And uh, I just want to echo your thoughts. Do take care, be safe, but don't Yes, panic. yes, and thank you. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.